Welcome everybody. I see everybody starting to file in. Welcome to Clay Art Center. We're very excited to have Max Seinfeld here with us tonight. He is originally from Danbury, Connecticut. He's uh, located right now in South Windsor, Connecticut. He was an artist in residence with Clay Art Center uh, from 2015 to 2016 and then the following year 2016 to 2017 and he's now the director of Sugar Maple Center for the Creative Arts in New York. He uh, graduated uh, SUNY New Paltz, um, and before that he got his BFA uh, in the University of Hartford, Connecticut. So I'm going to hand things over to Max and he's going to take you on a very special journey tonight and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Max. Thank you go you. ahead. All right, let me just share my screen. All right, and uh, just to, I'd just like to start off and echo what you said, Regina. Um, thank you guys and thank Clay Art Center so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a little strange, I have to say, because I'm used to seeing everyone's faces. So I'm now just staring at my own images. Um, so In Pursuit is the title of this lecture, and I like to structure it um, with a new title each way. And In Pursuit kind of speaks about the pursuit of asking questions in my own studio, uh, that ball of twine slowly unwinding as we make work and we craft this life around the objects we make. I'll be speaking about the people, places, and objects that influence the what I make on a daily basis. <clears throat> Before I go into my own work, I like to start off and just talk about Connecticut, uh, where I'm from. It's funny doing it with Clay Arts Center versus when I'm abroad, because most of you know uh, exactly where this is. Uh, but if, if you don't, um, I'm from Danbury, which is the low um, west side of the state, the pink section. And I grew up there. And then I went to school in Hartford, and I now live on the north uh, northeast section of the state. Uh, from from when my whole career, I've kind of just, this has been my home ground. We're lucky because we're in this one spot where we are close enough to Massachusetts and we're close enough to New York City. So everything was within a driving distance, uh, maybe a longer drive sometimes. And before, I, I, I kind of like to give you a little background from where I'm from. I grew up in a lake community uh, called Lake Wabika. It was founded in 1951 by Jewish firemen in the Bronx. Um, I like to bring this up because the community that I grew up in, it really influences what brought me to ceramics as a whole. Uh, the fun summers hanging out with people and jumping off the dock. This was a little bit before my time. Um, and also the family that helped uh, celebrate art and foster art in my house that I grew up in. I'm so grateful for that. In high school, I started off wood firing, and this was my first introduction to ceramics. Again, that, that level of community is what drew me. A group of five to 10 people surrounding um, a common goal to fire a kiln to make pots. And, and I didn't even have anything in this kiln, but it was uh, all working together, which is what brought me there. It was a really special experience. After that, I went to uh, University of Hartford in Connecticut for my BFA, where I studied with some really amazing uh, people, professors, uh, and made friendships that last today. Matt Towers uh, is this image who makes utilitarian and sculptural work. Uh, he's now my neighbor, and he makes fantastic uh, work and has taught me so much. <clears throat> When I was there, I was working within uh, process-oriented practices. These were sculptures that I were making by dipping fiber or fabric, uh, any organic matter into slip. And uh, once that uh, dried out, I would fire it, leaving a hollow shell. And then I would reconstruct these assemblages through multiple firings using glaze as an adhesive to hold pieces together. It kind of felt like uh, playing with Lego as a kid and um, also working with watercolor by layering glazes through multiple firings. I kind of think of this time and in the next images as a term called uh, working with blind hands. I was making aesthetic decisions based off of curiosity within my own studio practice. After uh, my BFA, I went to SUNY New Paltz in New York for one year as a post back. I was able to study with amazing professors like Brian Savez, who 3D prints his work, as well as Anat Shifton, who always has something amazing to say and um, 
just really makes you think about things differently when working. I started to uh, continue with that process that I was working on and, and deconstruct my idea of function through the vessel and then reconstruct it by removing the utility. <clears throat> Again, just making aesthetic decisions based off of my curiosity within the process and uh, the practice of making work. When I was there, I had the really amazing opportunity, someone who's here with us. Uh, I met Doug Peltzman, I assisted him in a workshop, and then I became his, became his studio assistant in his studio at home. Uh, there, I was working once a week with him and his family and um, got to know some, just got to be a part of his family. And, and still to this day, they're one of my favorite people. Um, while I was there, I helped him make his pots. He makes very different pots now. Um, but it was amazing because we got to not only make pots, uh, but also speak about what it is to craft a life around making objects. While I was there, I even got to have my own studio assistant, which was really great, his son, Grayson, who's a lot bigger now. Uh, from there, my eyes opened to the craft school experience. I started working at Peters Valley School of Crafts, where I got to meet uh, Bruce Stainer, who a lot of you know at uh, Clay Art Center. He's a fantastic maker and thinker. He makes pots like no other. And while I was there at that summer, I got to go to the studio every day um, on the top left corner and see images like that when we were firing the salt kiln. Uh, to Dan Molino in the middle top image, uh, twisting a cascading form, to the top right where Jack Troy uh, was changing a damper on the famous uh, wood firing kiln there. The bottom left image is Susan Beecher, who has now become a very important person in my life, um, who tells me, who told me back then a really great story about Al Pacino instructing her on how to stab someone properly. Deb Schwartzkopf, bottom middle, and Bruce goofing off. And Jennifer Ling Datchuk, bottom right, and Ryan Takaba, who really taught me how to make work that means something to me. And um, who, they're makers I look up to now. When I was there and working at the craft school experience um, at Peters Valley, each of these instructors would come in each week. Uh, so it was just this amazing influx of people visiting and getting to see not only the objects they make, but hear how they craft their life around those. While I was there, I got to go to Aramont School of Arts and Crafts in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, which has become a pretty important place to me. They have a fantastic boneyard collection of pots, and this is me uh, studying a Michael Simon teapot. And just being able to handle these pots uh, is re something really amazing. Of course, though, you have to wear um, covered shoes in the studio, which you know, I'm not in this. Um, right after that uh, experience that summer at Peters Valley, I went to Clay Art Center. And now this image is very familiar to, uh, I would say most people in this um, group. I love this image because Clay Art Center is this, I could just speak about Clay Art Center forever, I'm not going to, uh, but it's a cascading building that goes from one to the other in the typical fashion of New York. It's crawling. And uh, when I went there for the first time, I was always amazed. You, you went from one building to another building and another building, and then the downstairs annex. And uh, it's that community that helped foster um, the relationships I have today. And it, it's a really special place. When I was there as a resident artist the first year, I was surrounded by Chris Pickett, Kelly Donahue, other artists who had already had their master's degree and knew exactly what they were making. And to say I was scared would be putting it lightly. So what I didn't know what to do. I was making work that I, I was making work through a process and I didn't know why I was making other than the process leading me to an end result. So I said, what do, what do I like to look at? So I started going into New York City a lot and visiting museums. This is a solo wit uh, piece, uh, Bob Silverman, ceramic, Bobby Silverman, <clears throat> Alberto Giacometti. I was looking at all these images, Agnes Martin, as artists who I still love today, um, to see how they focused on composition, line, texture, <clears throat> different elements that create a finished piece, Ken Price, Ron Nagel, 
And when looking at these Chuck Close, I would say, why, why do, why am I drawn to this, right? Um, is it the color? Is it the line? What makes this a successful piece? Almost looking at it as a challenge. Ava Hesse, which each time this piece was installed, it would be a new piece, um, always changing. Ray Kawakuba, uh, I was lucky I could just take the metro into the city and go to the fashion exhibition each year. Uh, and these are the the works that I would just post in my studio. And then also look at the things around me. So looking at a close-up picture of a piece of steel um, that was down the street from me at a fire pit. And how that could then influence a body of work. So this body of work was made, um, I like to think of it as listening hands. It was making work off of observations. <clears throat> it was the interplay of contrasting relationships between hard and soft, texture, line, <clears throat> color, <clears throat> and from there, uh, I went to Penland while I was at Clay Art Center. I assisted a two-week workshop where I got to meet uh, another group of really fantastic makers, uh, Bandana Pottery, Michael Klein, who I think is in here tonight, and Adam Field, who has become a very close friend as well. And when assisting these makers, not only was I helping them achieve what they were making, but I was getting to understand the life that they had crafted around themselves, why it is what they make and why it is important. I went to Haystack up in Maine, which is a beautiful building. It's uh, built into the architecture of the Isle and the Deer Isle. And also got to watch a good game of badminton played with oversized rackets. Where else can you see that? I came back to Clare Art Center for my second year, and I thought, okay, now I've made work about compositional elements and what I see around me. How do I find something a little bit deeper? So I started to make observations. Flower bricks became a trend, and I wanted to play off of them and remove the utility and be a little um, cheeky, I guess. So all of these works um, are, you know, off of observations that I've made. Uh, this piece is called Languid. It's a painting. And I just loved how beautiful these women were and how lofty they looked, but they were to describing something that was not so nice to look at. How sweet honey can be, but maybe only within uh, moderation. What a bending drip can look like. When, constant, when gravity is a constant around us and what happens when you turn that on its edge. How sweet bubble gum can look before you put it in, its mouth, in your mouth. And then once it's out, maybe not so much. What a weighted squeeze might feel like when holding someone close What a kiss can be, but maybe when it's overdone versus when a nudge is just enough. How endearing a dribble can be from a little kid, um, but maybe not too close. How seductive and sweet a pinup girl can be um, and what happens when you transform that into a solid material. This piece is called Puffy Girl. I went back to the Fashion Institute and I looked at the Charles James exhibition and I just really enjoyed how these dress forms could be deconstructed and just look at parts or aspects or shapes of them. The idea of a lounging bell and how good something can be, but maybe a mouthful can be too much. The iconic Marilyn Monroe, but what it truly means to be beach body ready. And how, how thin a line can be broken before you know it.
after Clay Arts Center, I moved back home, uh, the home that I grew up in, and with, again, a very supportive family who helped me build a studio below our house. So we constructed this about 500 to 600 square foot studio uh, below our main living room. I had two working kilns there and a small workspace, and it's now being used for my dad as a studio, which I really enjoy. He makes printmaking. Um, while I was there, it was amazing because I didn't have rent uh, to pay, which afforded me opportunities to go out and um, do shows or travel uh, without a mortgage over my head. I met Hella Bovier, who invited me to go to be a part of um, the International Ceramic Exchange in Denmark. This was an exhibition called FOMO, where we responded to an apartment uh, in Aarhus, Denmark. And it was a, a, a set of apartments that was going to be taken down. And <clears throat> we were allowed to transform the interior of the apartment and make work based off of it. So this is her work based off the soft colors. Um, these were collaborative cups. It also featured utilitarian objects. So I flew to Denmark with another maker, Drew Johnson, and we helped. We, I don't believe we installed the exhibit, but we deconstructed it and helped document it. And while I was there, um, we taught and lectured throughout Denmark. I, was <clears throat> I made uh, connections to color through this apartment. I made friendships that have uh, been formidable through my life and the soft landscape in Denmark. When I came back, I was offered a, so, uh, a duo exhibition at the Old Church in New Jersey uh, by Colvinda Cordu, Bruce Dainert's wife, another fabulous maker. Uh, this was called Intoyant. It was a group exhibition between myself and Andrea Marquis. I used the space to create color fields on the wall, wall paintings. If any of you had seen my exit show at Clare Art Center, we uh, had done that with Chris Pickett as well. And so these wall paintings create a space or a resting spot, a landscape uh, for my work to live within. Um, I also really enjoyed how it kind of looked like a, a ship in some way, uh, like as if you were looking out a window. So after that work, um, I, I got sucked into dots, literally. This is a piece by Yahweh Kusama. Um, she is obsessed with dots, to say the least. And uh, this is another piece by hers. I wanted to create work that was a little bit more digestible by people, um, a little bit more universal, accessible, um, and so I, I really am now sucked totally into dots, similar to that woman's head. Um, <clears throat> I found this book, The Anatomy of Color by Patrick Beatty, which was a launch pad for an exhibition, a group exhibition in Denmark the following year. We spent almost 68 months studying color, the history of color, its places in an architecture throughout, his, uh, throughout different eras and made work responding to it. And through conversation uh, and a lot of trial and error, we were able to, myself, Hella Bobye, and Beth Bolga make a group exhibition within the um, Museum of Art and Design in Holstebro, Denmark, which you'll see pictures of soon. These are a few of my two-dimensional pieces. I work on paper as well. And, a lot of my work, as always, it goes back to composition, line, pattern, texture, a way to get sucked in. I started making these color fields, which I'll speak about a little bit uh, in a little bit. At first, they were just a way to remove the heaviness of the work I was making before. It was a way to focus on one object, like a cup, and um, change the color each time, change the flow of material. I thought about the joy of color. That's what we wound up naming the exhibition in the end. Pretty in pink. <clears throat> so this is um, the House of Art and Design in Holsterboro. 
we had a five gallery show and we used a line to draw the audience through the exhibition space. The previous year I had visited this structure, uh, the school itself, I had taught there and I just fell in love with the architecture there. I wanted to respond to the architecture and do justice to the space when entering it. So this is the joy of color. So you'll see my work, um, my paintings, my sculpture. <clears throat> this piece is called uh, Being a Kid in a Candy Shop or the Joy of Color. I created, um, I think there's about 20 pieces that uh, were all wall painted onto, the, onto these two walls using just the primary colors and white and black uh, to create an array of color to create this composition. Here's another view. Beth Volga's wall paintings and baskets. And Helle Baudier moving very quickly past of her, each of her Unomis, which are uh, absolute feast for the eye paintings, each of them. An installation in another gallery by Hella. And this is a portrait I took of Anna Meta Kuhl Peterson, who uh, did a performance in response to our exhibition. And after this trip, uh, this is a portrait of Hella Bovier. Um, again, just noticing what we notice around us. This was uh, a shed we had passed, and we just we thought the shed spoke really truly to our exhibition. Uh, right after that exhibition, I taught for a week to these students that ranged in age from um, high school to college age students. We did color theory work for uh, a full week and it was amazing. They were uh, completely explorative and they tried things, they were daring. And I just like to uh, show a little bit about them because it was amazing to work with them. Each day, it was a new class. We walked through the exhibition, spoke about the history of color, how it relates to what we make. And, um, and then they would make uh, compositions in response to their studies in color. This work is not what I helped with the students, but I did help photograph them. Uh, as you can see through my slide presentation, uh, photographs are really important to me. So these were wearable object sculptures that the students have made. And I just thought, um, again, it relates so much to our exhibition as a whole, three different shades of blue all in one made out of straws and also just the pastel but vibrant colors in these straws made into a necklace. I came back home from that exhibition and I did a three, um, three set show with Sarah Heitmeyer, who's a tri-state area artist as well. Um, the first one was called In Line. For me, the way that I translated that was talking about the seductive quality of graphite and it reflected in the exhibition. So I made these color fields that were opposite from what I had had in Denmark and um, removed the color and did a gradation uh, shades of gray. From there, we went to In Space, which was the second exhibition. Um, these, I was looking at 60s futural homes, which were designed to be built on any landscape, constructed quickly and heated quickly. Um, and I love that contrast between um, the, this idea of putting something beautiful to look at, unique and inspiring, but maybe not so functional to live within. And I had made work in response to that. And our third in, um, uh, installation of this three-part exhibition was called in space. And this was, uh, my work was mostly inspired by Marina Abramovic's pieces, uh, The Space Between Us. And I just really love in this piece, uh, just the uncomfortable nature. So there's, you know, throughout my, all my work, there's these, these contrasts that I'm playing with. I, I love the, the, the tension that is highlighted um, when two people are forced to be walking near each other or, or two colors. Um, are right near each other and they're supposed to be connected, but not. Uh, 
and and then um and then I started looking at candy. Um, I I love this idea of being a kid in a candy shop, um, making work that was less serious and focused on joy, um, and a feast for the eyes. And so all of these pieces, I, I don't I don't know if I had mentioned, but um, my work is small scale, so they're about like. This is, I think, two and a half inches by uh, one and a half inches. They're micro. So I like this uh, opportunity for the viewer to be sucked into this world that I'm creating through the objects that I make. And this piece, uh, the blue is inspired by RuPaul's main stage. So there's always this tongue in cheek of pop culture references. Um, <clears throat> after those exhibitions and making that work, I just want to speak a little bit about Sugar Maple Center for Creative Arts. Um, it's a really fantastic place, which I now work at. I had gotten back from Denmark and Susan Beecher had called me and she said that she was uh, looking for someone to shadow her. And, and I came up that next day, I got off the plane and spoke to her and visited the school. Um, this is a postcard from, from the school in its original um, state in the in the 60s, I believe, when it was a resort that actually my grandparents went to. And I, I love using this postcard because it's just so classy, but also the back side of it, um, it reads, Dearest Dells, this is a spot, beautiful and really away from it all. Um, they speak about a gift shop and so forth, so much going mountain climbing. And I think uh, what we do through the craft school experience and creating these spaces for people to create, uh, like Clay Art Center and other community centers, is that we create a space for people to make friendships, uh, try new things in the studio, laugh, and, um, and get away from it all, as, as the Dells wrote. This is Dimitri Wright, uh, plein air painting last summer, or two summers ago now. Uh, Lisa Chicoin from uh, originally Greenwich House Pottery, and she did a workshop on paper clay. Jeff A. Strike, and just that moment of uh, brilliance when a handle's put on in the studio. And so I, I love. I love these images because it really talks about the joy that we have at the craft school in the craft school experience. Um, I get to drive this really amazing golf cart, and this is Jen Allen. As I'm, uh, she had me push her around all week. It was really exhausting, um, but it it's a really special place, and I'm always reminded of that. And it's in in almost every aspect of the day from when we wake up and we start in the studio to when we're sharing lunch together or we're having these uh, kind of goofy moments like this. It, it is an experience like no other. The craft school experience is not in uh, other countries. It's, it's stateside specific mainly, I would say. Um, and so it, I feel so fortunate to be there. Um, after that summer, uh, we decided to make our family a little bit bigger. Uh, for those of you who I haven't seen at Clay Art Center, this might be a surprise. And uh, a sometimes goofy family, my partner on the right, Ryan, and our little dog now, uh, Charlie. And, and then a month or two after that, we decided to buy a house. And uh, with that, my partner even let me try some installation ideas, some that didn't work so well, as you can see with the poke dotted house. And then I built another studio again. So this is uh, the first iteration of the studio at our house now. Um, when we had moved in, there was shag carpeting that was brown, orange, uh, multicolored, and brown walls. And so the space has come along quite a way, but it still has some way to go. And then COVID hit. And I like to use this image just because it's something we're all going through right now. There were specific reference points of um, certain people who have made images like this, but this was my piece I titled Dear COVID, Letter from a Young Artist. And it, it threw my world upside down. Um, I had planned a summer to be upstate. We had got all of our artists in a row as, 
as every institution had, and then we had to cancel it and a flip uh, flip of a second. So, um, but with that came new ideas, and I was able to continue working in the studio and um, slow things down a bit, stop making so much for exhibitions. Um, and not only off of design principles, but make work that means a lot to me. And I, so I think of this as making work with open eyes. <clears throat> My color fields are based off of these color vision tests uh, for someone who's colorblind. They serve as a feast for the eyes, creating a reflecting pool to the tangible desires. Like Narcissus and his reflection, his eye is seduced by line, color, and pattern pulled from specific reference points in film, fashion, and queer culture. <clears throat> I match the shade of red used in Cardi B's red bottoms or the saturated colors of macaroons to employ notes of camp, glam, the exaggerated, and the bizarre. This is my take on macaroons. It was a sweet summer. I approach my small scale sculpture and installations with a seriousness that fails to be defined and an excitement in the studio akin to Dorothy and her trio running through a field of poppies while slowly falling under their spell. This, this image was supposed to be a little bit before, uh, but this is called Filthy Rich. It's my take on uh, gaudy interior homes. And this is my piece in regards to Dorothy falling under their spell. So these, uh, these now have kind of shifted to using metallic colors. Um, so each, each, there's specific parts of it that I can pull apart, like the red bottom shoes, the metallic colors in camp or glam um, and gold. And so I'd like to just end on this image. Uh, it's one of the soft landscapes in Denmark that I so enjoy when I was there. Uh, I like to end each of my lectures with a quote that I come back to time and time again. And it's really hard to do this without seeing you all. Um, but I, you know, it's especially pertinent. I recently just lost uh, one of my original, uh, my youngest art teachers, I just found out yesterday. And so I like to share this quote that Fred Rogers asked the audience to take 10 seconds to think of the people who helped them become who they are today. He said, let us think of those who have cared about us and wanted what is best for you in life in 10 seconds and I'll watch the clock. He concluded this 10 seconds by saying, whomever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must be to know the difference you made in your life. And I like to just use that because all of the people, places and objects that I've spoke about tonight, have influenced each and every object that I make in my own studio. And thank you for being a part of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. And uh, it's uh, a really special note to end our uh, 2020 uh, virtual artist programming with you. And um, I hope to, uh, uh, Michael Klein said, thank you, Play Arts Centre, for ha having this series. Yeah, you're welcome, Michael. We're Delighted to have it. And uh, as I was saying, it's a pleasure to end it with uh, Max. And I hope we'll see you at Clay Arts Centre soon. And good night, everybody. Thank you, Max. Thank you so much.